Now in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine, podcast, and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1194 of This Week in Amateur Radio. A large grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications will make available grants to local radio clubs. We will have all the details you need to know. China is expanding its South China Sea antenna farms. Amateurs in the Northern Hemisphere are preparing for the upcoming Winter Field Day 2022. A new section manager is appointed for Delaware. Pictures from the 2021 ARIS program are selected as NASA's best space station photos of the year. A growing number of amateurs are completing worked all states on, get this, 220 megahertz. We'll have all the details. An important annual DX convention is canceled due to the increasing COVID pandemic. And Elon Musk's worldwide internet service Starlink has run into an unusual problem with its downlink receive antennas. We will tell you all about it in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk with JPL space engineer Rod Pyle about the launch and deployment of the exciting new James Webb telescope. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will explore amateur radio projects made from unobtainium. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill looks at the amateur radio products and happenings in the 1930s. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell you the tricks of the trade involved when you have to climb your tower at night. And we will have the latest update from Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air with Vance Martin, N3VEM. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where we are preparing for winter storm Izzy, who's supposed to dump about a foot of snow on us, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, we're expecting anywhere between one foot and four feet of snow from Snowstorm Izzy, which is bearing down on us. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our underground news bureau in the Geek Cave studios, just outside Albany, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, amid rows of icicles, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I wonder if we're going to get a snowfall or a snow job. Weather is difficult to forecast in this mountainous terrain. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, hoping it's snowfall. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, a new AWRL Foundation Club grants program funded by a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications will make $500,000 available to radio clubs. With more on this exciting new program, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. The program will provide up to $25,000 for worthy club projects. Requests for more than that will be referred back to ARDC. Beginning in April, amateur radio clubs will be able to apply for these grants by filling out a simple form on the ARRL website. Hang on, it's not there yet. The ARRL Foundation will evaluate the grant proposals, a key criterion for determining awards, will be how the project will advance amateur radio in the grantees' community. 
In most cases, this process should take no longer than 90 days. ARDC is a California-based foundation that awards grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. ARRL has long recognized that it is in the best interests of amateur radio to encourage and support amateur radio clubs. Clubs historically have recruited, licensed, and trained new radio amateurs and have provided the community setting for radio amateurs to continue their education and training. The new club grants program will help clubs more easily provide and expand their important services. The foundation was established in 1973 to advance the art, science, and societal benefits of the amateur radio service by awarding financial grants and scholarships to individuals and organizations in support of their charitable, educational, and scientific efforts. ARRL Foundation President David Woolweaver, K5RAV, shared his enthusiasm about this new program. The program will substantially contribute to the growth of amateur radio clubs and their efforts to expand and support the amateur radio community, he said. Rosie Schechter, ARDC Executive Director, is equally enthusiastic. She notes that this program will streamline the process for getting clubs projects funded so that clubs can get started on these projects more quickly. We're very excited about working with the ARRL Foundation on this program, she says. We can't wait to see what kinds of creative things clubs will do with these grants. Established in 1973 by the ARRL as an independent 501c3 organization, the ARRL Foundation is funded entirely by the generous contributions of radio amateurs, friends, and now the ARDC. The Foundation advances the amateur radio service by awarding financial grants and scholarships to individuals and amateur radio organizations in support of their charitable, educational, and scientific efforts. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based foundation with roots in amateur radio and the technology of internet communication. The organization got its start by managing allocations of the AmperNet address space, which is designated to licensed amateur radio operators worldwide. Additionally, ARDC makes grants to projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communication science. Such experimentation has led to broad advances for the benefit of the general public, including the mobile phone and wireless internet technology. ARDC envisions a world where all such technology is available through open source hardware and software, and where anyone has the ability to innovate upon it. To learn more about ARDC, please visit https colon forward slash forward slash www.ampr.org. A December 17th commentary from the Center for Strategic and International Studies has concluded that over the past year, China has taken what it calls major steps to upgrade its capability to wage electronic warfare near the South China Sea. The Center for Strategic and International Studies cites satellite images of massive antenna complexes to back its claim. Some facilities have already been suspected of jamming the communication facilities of U.S. military aircraft operating in the region. The Chinese military is taking major steps toward improving its electronic warfare, communications, and intelligence gathering capabilities near the South China Sea, said the commentary by Matthew P. Funayol, Joseph S. Bermudez Jr., and Brian Hart, all associated with Center for Strategic and International Studies. Recent satellite imagery reveals that China has rapidly expanded facilities Mumayan on Hainan Island, providing the People's Liberation Army with greater ability to track and counter foreign military forces operating in the region and in outer space. The commentary said, many assets in the vicinity appear dedicated to gathering communications intelligence, a subset of signals intelligence, that includes the collection of communications between individuals and organizations. Some of China's land claims in the South China Sea include rare DXCC entities, Scarborough Reef is one. Conflicting land claims exist for other islands, especially in the Spratlys. Further complicating the situation is a 2016 ruling from the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague that discounted China's claims with respect to Scarborough Reef and the Spratlys. The court ruled in favor of the Philippines in a dispute with China over Scarborough Reef. In April 2015, a Chinese naval vessel harassed a Philippine Air Force patrol flight in the Spratlys, according to one news account.
by firing an illumination round. The incident postponed a Philippine Navy flight that was to evacuate an ailing participant of the DX-0P Spratly Islands D expedition. A private aircraft carrying a BBC reporter received radio warnings from the Chinese Navy to stay away from the South China Sea reefs and islands that China claims, strongly suggesting that China has expanded its sphere of influence to include the entire region. This and the more recent artificial island building in the South China Sea cloud the possibility of future de-expeditions to rare DXCC entities in the South China Sea, whether or not China has laid specific claim. The Spratleys are claimed in whole or in part by China, the Philippines, Vietnam, and other countries, and the Philippines government has issued the DX0P call sign. An international amateur radio team postponed a December 2017 de-expedition to the Spratly Islands operating under Malaysian callsign 9M0W, although the de-expedition did take place the following year. The planned 2012 DX0DX de-expedition to the Spratlys was canceled altogether without explanation after being pushed back at least twice. The last operation from Scarborough Reef was in 2007. Amateurs all across the Northern Hemisphere are getting ready for Winter Field Day 2022, which is happening on January 29th and 30th. As the organizers state on their website, being ready for emergency communications isn't just an exercise done when the sun is shining and the weather is mild. In the Northern Hemisphere, where temperatures can easily drop below freezing this time of year, and snow and ice can complicate the scenario, hams are preparing to operate using a variety of permissible modes with CW, Sideband, DMR, and PSK among them. Winter field day rules prohibit operation on FT8 or FT4, however. QRP and low are the only power categories this year, with operators using 100 watts or less. For a look at the rules and the logging instructions, visit winterfieldday.com. That's winterfieldday, one word, dot com. The Volunteer Monitor, or VM, program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the December 2021 Activity Report of the Volunteer Monitor Program Report for December 2021. Operators in Center Hill and Coconut Creek, Florida were issued notices for excessive signal bandwidth on 40 and 75 meters in violation of Section 97.307, Subpart A of FCC Rules. General Class Operators in Hudson, Florida, Winterville, Georgia, Provo, Utah, and Bloomfield Hills, Jackson, and Howell, Michigan received notices for out-of-band single sideband operation on frequencies not permitted by their General Class licenses in violation of Section 97.301 of FCC rules. Technician class operators in Baltimore, Maryland, DeVernon, Illinois, Moore, Oklahoma, Bradenton, Florida, and Roseville and Rancho Cordova, California received notices for FT8 operation on unauthorized 20 and 40 meter frequencies in violation of section 97.301 of FCC rules. Commendations for exemplary amateur radio operation were issued to licensees in these cities. Dallonega, Georgia, for managing medical and technical issues during the Six Gap Century Bicycle Race in October. Riverside, California, for operation during the October Earthquake Situational Emergency Test. Swansea, South Carolina, for operation on the South Carolina HF Aries Net. Springfield, Indiana, for assistance to new operators in message handling. MIMS, Florida, for exceptional efforts in correcting wideband issues and operators in Raymond, Mississippi, for exemplary operation during ARRL field day, statewide HF and VHF nets, and assistance to new operators. The totals for VM monitoring in November were 1,901 hours on HF frequencies and 2,784 hours on VHF frequencies and above for a total of 4,685 hours. There was one referral to the FCC for enforcement assistance. 
We thank Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. On Monday, January the 3rd, the Board of Directors of Germany's DARC, National Amateur Radio Society, were joined by 140 members online for a discussion about the future of amateur radio. The board directors included DARC Chair Christian Delta Lima 3 Mike Bravo Golf, Ernst Delta Lima 3 Golf Bravo Echo and Ronnie Delta Golf 2 Romeo Oscar November and they said that they had clearly shown how they envisioned the future of amateur radio in Germany and had received a lot of positive feedback. They considered it a great success that so many members accepted their invitation. DARC Chair Christian Delta Lima 3 Mike Bravo Golf started with the question, how secure is our future? In the context of this presentation, the main focus was on looking at the changes in amateur radio over time, highlighting the problems and opportunities of digitization and working out the strategic goals for 2030 and beyond. The results of the IARU survey on the strengths, weaknesses, risks and opportunities of amateur radio in Germany were discussed and the IARU was represented by Liaison Officer Jörg, Delta Juliet 3, Hotel Whiskey. He compared the eight strategic goals of the IARU with the existing DARC statutes. It was clear that the DARC statutes already covered many of these aspects. With the help of concrete, practice-orientated examples, it was agreed that the strategic considerations could be made more tangible for the audience. In the meantime, the participants exchanged their own experiences and ideas, as well as current practice in the local clubs. In particular, the topics of recruiting young talent, maintaining members, public image and public relations were all lively discussed. Members also talked about some interesting and promising approaches, such as more social media involvement and easier access to amateur radio. Recently introduced ham groups in particular, and thus the focus on other target groups, met with broad approval. The DARC chair said that at the meetings they were primarily concerned with increasing communication with the members and enabling them to participate in the future planning work of the DARC. He said that they had not only wanted to provide information about their work, but also to engage together on setting the course for the future. The numerous positive comments from the group of participants showed how successful the evening was. In conclusion, many thanked the Board of Directors for their work and praised their systematic analysis of the future of amateur radio. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, an assistant professor at the University of Scranton, Department of Physics and Electrical Engineering, has received a National Science Foundation grant of nearly $50,000 to support the 2022 Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, or Ham SCI Workshop. The event is set for March 18th and 19th at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The in-person conference also has a virtual format option. Ham SCI is a collective of professional researchers and radio amateurs with the objective to foster collaboration between the amateur radio and professional communities to advance scientific research and understanding, encourage development of new technologies to support this research, and provide educational opportunities for both the amateur radio community and the general public. The workshop will serve as a team meeting for the HAM SCI Personal Space Weather Station Project, the beneficiary of a $1.3 million National Science Foundation funded project grant awarded to Frizzell. That project seeks to harness the power of a network of radio amateurs to better understand and measure the effects of weather in the upper levels of Earth's atmosphere. The theme for the two-day HAM SCI workshop is the Weather Connection. The fifth annual workshop will feature prominent leaders in space weather, atmospheric weather, and the connection between them. The workshop series has led to cutting-edge work in the fields of space physics, citizen science, and the use of crowdsource ionospheric data, Frizzell said. To maximize the potential of the ham radio and professional researcher relationship, meetings are needed to bring these groups together to learn about each other's communities and vocabularies, to share ideas, and to participate in activities that advance both the scientific field and the radio hobby. Frizzell's research focuses on the ionosphere, the atmospheric region that extends 50 to 600 miles above Earth's surface. According to Frizzell, changes in the ionosphere alter the behavior of radio wave propagation and greatly affect the radio communications and global navigation satellite systems. 
understanding ionospheric structures and processes will lead to an increased understanding and prediction of these effects, he said. The National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Committee has released the 2022 through 2026 Technician Class FCC Element 2 National Conference of Volunteer Examiner Coordinators Question Pool Syllabus and Question Pool into the public domain. The new Question Pool is available as a Word document or PDF. The three graphics required for the new Technician Question Pool are available within those documents or separately as a PDF or JPG files. The new pool incorporates some significant changes compared to the 2018 through 2022 pool. Its 257 questions were modified slightly to improve wording or to replace distractors. 51 new questions were generated. 62 questions were eliminated. This results in a reduction of 11 questions, bringing the total number of questions in the pool from 423 to 412. The difficulty level of the questions is now more balanced, and the techniques and practices addressed have been updated. The new 2022 through 2026 question pool is effective July 1, 2022, and will remain in effect until June 30, 2026, and must be used for technician class license exams administered on or before July 1st of 2022. Until very recently, it had been some 35 years since the most recent Worked All States was awarded on 1.25 meters. With more details on this significant award, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting for the ARRL from Ellsworth, Maine. Former ARRL President Joel Harrison, W5ZN in Arkansas, Marshall Williams, K5QE in Texas, and John Swinierski, K1OR in New Hampshire, stand at the vanguard of a new generation of VHF enthusiasts aiming at earning the Worked All States Award on 222 megahertz. Harrison was issued WAS number 11 on one and a quarter meters on December 27th, while Williams was issued WAS number 12 on January 11th, and Swinierski was issued WAS number 13 on January 12th. Since the 1980s, a combination of the old guard and a new group have been pursuing this quest, ARRL radio sport manager Mark Yankee, W9JJ, said. The honor of being the very first 1.25-meter WAS award recipient, Terry Van Benschoten, W0VB, in 1983, earning what was then 220 megahertz WAS. In 1988, when the FCC reallocated the lower portion, that's the uh, lower 2 megahertz of the one and a quarter meter band to the federal government and land mobile service, amateur activity on the band stalled while adjustments were made to equipment and band plants. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Harrison worked Tom Worthington, NH6Y, in Hawaii for his 50th state, while Williams followed close behind, working James Colson, K7KQA, operating EME Portable from Oregon for his 50th state. In recent years, several stations have been working hard towards joining the ranks of worked all states holders on this ITU Region 2 only band, Yankee said. Other stations that have recently worked 50 states and waiting on the last confirmations include K1WHS, WA4NJP, and K1OR. N9HF and N0AKC are nipping at their heels. No activity on 1.25 meters was available in some of the last few needed states, and portable operations by KA6U, KB7Q, K7KQA, and N7GP made contacts possible. Congratulations to Joel and Marshall, and to all those VHF Plus state chasers, and to the many activators of rare 222 megahertz states on their achievements in this continuing quest for 222 megahertz worked all states, Yankee said. During the past several years, so-called weak signal activity, especially EME, has increased on the band with a renewed interest from existing and new band users. Amateurs interested in staying abreast of 222 MHz activity can follow the fun on the 222 MHz activity reflector. Harrison, Charlie Betts, N0AKC, and Al Ward, W5LUA, have written an article, The Quest for 222 MHz Worked All States, which contains tables, maps, and details on the propagation, locations, and equipment that made their operations possible. Ward was among the initial 10 Worked All States recipients for 1.25 meters. 
Plans call for the paper to be presented and published by the Central States VHF Society Conference in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, July 29th and 30th, and at other conferences. Harrison said the paper also has lots of history in it about the 1.25 meter band, the original 10, and the group now in the hunt along with ongoing roving efforts of KB7Q and KA6U. After this story was posted, ARRL announced that it has validated the 222 megahertz Worked All States application of John Swinarski, K1OR, for Worked All States number 13. His last contact was with NH6Y in Hawaii on January 9th. Responding to concern over the unprecedented upsurge in COVID-19 cases, organizers of the International DX Convention in Visalia, California, have called off the annual event, which is considered one of the premier amateur radio DX conventions. It was to have been held beginning April 8th, hosted by the Southern California DX Club and the Northern California DX Club. International DX Convention co-chairs Bill Kendrick, N6RV, and Mel Hughes, K6SY, posted this announcement on the International DX Convention website. It is with regret that the 2022 International DX Convention in Visalia, California, has been canceled. The Convention Committee of the Southern California DX Club acted in response to the current COVID-19 virus threat. The organizers are looking forward to hold the convention in 2023. The group asks that everyone who has hotel reservations to cancel your reservation as soon as possible so that the hotels can resell their rooms. The World Radio Sport Team Championship was conceived as an Olympic-style competition amongst radio contesters, where teams of two compete from the same locations using identical stations, thereby being a true test of operator skills. The championship is usually held every four years and is run over 24 hours in conjunction with the IARU HF Championship on the second full weekend in July. This year's event was to be held in Italy, but has been postponed to 2023 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The WRTC organisers are running an award programme from January the 1st to July the 10th this year to promote the competition in Italy next year. Special event stations will be active on all bands and modes from each of the Italian call areas using the suffix Whiskey, Romeo, Tango, Charlie. Each Morse contact will be worth 10 points, single sideband 5 points and radio teleprinter 4 points. You'll need 50 points to qualify for the award. Contact totals and award hunter scores are available in real time at wrtc2022.it forward slash award. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. It's time for our rocket man, Rod Pyle, space engineer. The James Webb Telescope now oh has, God. now they say fully deployed. What does that mean? means that everything that needs to fold and latch is apparently folded and latched. Now, I had thought that there was going to be a longer latching sequence for these mirrors. They deployed the second. It, you saw, I'm sure, the graphic of the, of the mirrors folding out. So it's got a center chunk, and then the last two panels on the sides have to fold out to make it that roughly circular shape. So they folded out yesterday, the last one, and apparently has latched or is latching. So, and these numbers keep changing. It's interesting. You know, you read the press releases and depending on where it's from, whether it's NASA or Northrop Grumman who made the thing or another NASA one, the number of deployments and single points of failure keep changing. The last one I read, which is from Grumman, so it's probably Northrop Grumman, so it's probably, you know, you, I think you can count on it. 50 major deployments, 178 major release mechanisms, and 344 single points of failure. Wow. You know, whether it's a few more or a few less doesn't matter. It's pretty scary. But, you know, I think the one that everybody was really scared of was that Sun Shield because it alone had a hundred, you're going to love this, 140 release mechanisms, 70 hinges, 400 pulleys, 90 cables, and eight hooks. It's a Rube Goldberg and, device, but it works. It is. And, you know, and, and we worry about is our software going to work? I mean, <laughs> talk about going back to the electromechanical age. But, but they've been working on this 20 it. years. And yeah. obviously did as much testing as they could. You can't test in zero gravity, but they did the best That's they the could. Problem. And, and, you know, they've been working on the project 20 years, really working on that thing for about eight. 
so seven or eight. So it's amazing. I it's just not it blows quite, me away. Yeah. It blows well, me and it's away. just you know I'm practically quivering when I hear this news. I can't imagine how they feel because of course they've been on pins and needles for months and yeah. months and months. Yeah, you can only hold so, your breath um, for so many months before you start to get turned blue. Really, I, I mean, honestly, I, I have to say, you know, I had kind of the same reaction when I saw what the web had to do to when I did uh, how I felt the first time I saw how the Curiosity rover was going to land. <laughs> And oh, I was man. writing a yeah. book about it. It's crazy. So I was, I was Rube shadowing Goldberg. the chief yeah. engineer, really nice guy named Rob Manning. And I said, why? You know, there's so many other ways to do this. Why? And he said, believe it or not, it was the fewest points of failure we wow. could find. And we've tested it as far as we can. Wow. And I think the same is true with the web. So it's, it's as simple as they could yeah. make it, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. simple as they could make it and achieve what they want and be pretty sure things were going to go wrong. Because yeah. that, like... Yeah. They JPL guys were very fascinated with the Chinese uh, Mars rover because it drove down off a lander platform. They had done that in the 2000s, but they didn't want to do it with a big one. And it was a little different than the way JPL did right. it. JPL NASA did it. So they're, you know, really fascinated with uh, the Chinese program right. as well. Right. But man, what a time to be alive. We're still here to see this, you know? Oh, that's exciting. Now, what about uh, the Big Bang uh, stuff? So I guess he far enough that it could actually see to almost the beginning of the universe. Is that accurate? Like two to 300 million years after. Yeah, that's so it's, it's pretty early. It's, yeah. I mean, it's not like, you know, the second hand's about to tick over to midnight, right. but it's pretty darn close considering right. how old the universe is, 13 something billion years. That's way back there. So yeah, really early star formation, really early galaxy formation. We'll be able to see kind of the, the temper tantrums of the early universe. What, what kind of thing First could hand. we learn from that? You know, crawling in high, inside the head of an astrophysicist is a scary place. <laughs> really smart people. Well, I could tell you, but it would uh, you would not understand. Yeah. <laughs> I studied this stuff at UCLA in the seventies, and of course, all that's nonsense yeah. now for the most yeah. part. But yeah, you know, you find out about the early makings of the universer, and we answer a lot of questions about how we got here. I can't wait. It's so it's, exciting. It's, it's that so and the exciting. exoplanet thing. And by the way, that HabX I told you about, yeah, that HabX telescope, yeah, that's actually going to have a star shield extended out from the front of it so you've got the telescope tube and then you've essentially got a disc that looks kind of like a sunflower a daisy out however many hundreds of feet in front of it and that blocks the light from the star so you can see the faint planets around the edge so that's it's not very big but it's going to be really really effective interesting it's a interesting this little yeah. mini uh mini uh, eclipse it'll be creating yeah exactly yeah, yeah. exactly how cool yeah, so. so it's about 75% of the way out to its final orbital location at L2. That's about 674,000 miles from Earth, 225,000 to go roughly. Hot sides, 131 Fahrenheit, cold sides minus 278. Once it gets out to that orbital location, it's still got months of calibration to do. And that's a little scary because things can still go wrong. Well, we remember the like Hubble major. where when they calibrated it, it turned out to be blurry. Yeah, but you can bet they double check the focus <laughs> on this guy. Okay. Yeah. I remember reading an interview with that poor guy who was in charge oh. of the optic for the Hubble. Oh. And he said, you know, it's just the skip we didn't do because of money. Oh. And they discovered that it wasn't in oh. focus. But the that difference one you is fix. the this Hubble was in an orbit you could go to, which right. they did, and fix. Right. You're not going to fly out to Lagrange too, too often. It would be tough. You know, there's been talk about the possibility of a robotic servicing mission. Yeah. There's been some speculation about, you know, could SpaceX reach it if they had to? Yeah, but it's a dangerous place to go. It's a long And you're not going to send humans. It really is. It's almost well, a million miles probably out. Probably not. It is. But, you know, this isn't much scarier than the asteroid uh, rendezvous they were going to do back during the Obama administration, right. which got canceled. But it's a similar kind of a journey. But it's got to go out, go out there, calibrate, cool down you know, get to its final chill. Most of it's passive, but they do have some cryo coolers. And there are some components that need to be down like minus 450 Fahrenheit, but they'll do it. And uh, then, you know, what we're all looking forward to, of course, is those first images and what they mean, right? Looking back at the very beginning of time. Yeah. That's what's, you know, just so yeah. exciting. So let, tell me about that. We got, a, we got a few minutes left. So this telescope, when it goes online in about five or six months... Is that right? Roughly? Yeah, about five. We'll start yeah. sending images back. Is it like the Hubble where different scientists kind of have to, you know, jostle to get time on oh, it yeah. and aim it? And, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And time is precious. And, you know, it's interesting, by the way, the Hubble over its life, if you adjust the money, cost almost as much as this. Yeah. So, but we got to look at, let's not knock the Hubble. We got a lot of, a lot of stuff out of the Hubble. Um, And the public relations value to NASA with Hubble. I mean, that's the gift that keeps giving, right? And they've got larger telescopes planned. I was doing some reading yesterday. They've got one called, I think it's pronounced Luvior. It's a large ultraviolet optical infrared surveyor. Probably a 50-foot primary mirror. Wow. So twice as wide as this thing. So it's huge. It looks a lot like the web. And they're talking, you know, between 20, 25, 20, 35. But that would be pretty much, it would be able to do a lot of things. But one of the main purposes really is looking at exoplanets and web will do that but this of course would be much more sensitive right then i've got another one exo let's explain what an exoplanet is oh sorry yeah it's a planet around another star another solar system we want to see if we can look at the rocky planets there's another telescope they're planning called habex which can do that it's amazing because we didn't even know there were whether there were other planets until the last 20 years this is relatively yeah. new now we're starting to look for not only other planets and other systems but other planets like the earth right so you know it's it's kind of easy to find the big ones because they actually affect the star they're orbiting the jupiters so of measure, the, uh, of the yeah. world yeah so if you measure the dimming or if you measure the motion of the star you can you can tell indirectly but spotting the rocky ones is tough and that's the next step wow rocky is if- good Rocky's not Rocky gassy. Is good because yeah. No, Rocky is not a big ball of gas. Rocky, right. we think there might be water and there. organisms and yeah. more of us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah more so of that's us. what so you know, <laughs> the next 10, 15 years is going to be really exciting in astrophysics. And if Starship gets going, as we discussed, you can start launching these telescopes without all this folding stuff. <laughs> you know, you just jam it in there and go. You could make it out of lead if you wanted and set it up. Really? There, it's, there's so that powerful. they're that capacious? There's that much room? It's a 30 to 33 feet, I think. Oh, wow. So, you know, for a really big one, you'd still want to fold it, but you wouldn't need all these. Wouldn't have to be these, so, uh, so much matter. origami yeah. involved. Yeah. You're, exactly. There wouldn't have to be, you know, yeah. 400 folds. There'd yeah. be like three. Yeah. And you could have a crew out there to deploy it if you wanted. Very cool. It's it, uh, You know, yeah. we wanted to get you on the show because it's time to start talking about space once again. And yeah. boy, I, I, I couldn't be happier uh, at the kinds of things we're talking about. Rod Pyle. Me neither. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. On March 4, 1929, Herbert Hoover, the former Secretary of Commerce who had helped amateur radio during its embryonic years, became President of the United States. Less than eight months later, the nation was thrown into the Great Depression. Stock prices fell 80%, the gross national product fell 50%, and unemployment was at 25%. It did not sound like a good time to waste money on a frivolous hobby such as amateur radio. And yet, the early 1930s was the period of the greatest growth in our history. From 1929 census of 16,829 Amateur radio expanded 276% in five years to a total of 46,390 in 1934. What was life like in our hobby of 75 years ago? QST was 25 cents per issue. One of the interesting columns in it was called Calls Heard, which was simply a list of page after page of call signs that were heard by various stations reporting in. Each month, hams would scan the hundreds of calls listed to see if their signals had been noticed. One of the call signs listed was W2XAF, which was not an amateur station, but rather the shortwave relay of WGY Schenectady. In fact, in the 1930s, there were so many broadcast stations with shortwave relays that the call book listed them in addition to amateur call signs. Most of the ads in QST at that time were for components to construct your own station. Tubes, resistors, and condensers, not capacitors, condensers, were displayed in full-page ads. RCA and DeForest were the dominant entities in the tube field. If you needed A, 
B and C batteries, the Burgess Battery Company in Madison, Wisconsin would supply them. As the 1930s progressed, more companies appeared with kits or even assembled units. Hammerland, then known as Hammerland Roberts Incorporated, made its debut with the AC Pro, an eight-tube Superhat receiver. National's new receiver was the SW3. Radio Engineering Labs, known as REL of Long Island City, supplied low-cost transmitters and receiver kits. In 1931, one of these kits was at the center of a legal battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. RCA, which held the DeForest patents on the regenerative circuit, sued REL. Edwin Armstrong, who actually invented regeneration but lost a controversial court battle with DeForest, saw this as an opportunity to win back his patent. He purchased 51% of REL stock and proceeded to fight the grand battle once more. Unfortunately, in 1934, the Supreme Court ruled that DeForest, not Armstrong, was the inventor of regeneration. Armstrong could take some small consolation in that another of his inventions was finally put to good use in amateur radio, Super Regeneration. Invented in the early 1920s, Super Regeneration provides very high sensitivity on AM signals. However, it has almost no selectivity, a very high noise level in the absence of stations, and radiated a broad interfering signal to nearby receivers. It was useless on medium wave or short wave, but was perfect for the 5 meter band at 56 megacycles. During the early 1930s, Ross Hall, QST's associate editor, wrote many articles about 5 meters and the surprising propagation there. Many phone stations appeared on the 56 megacycle band and almost all used Super Regeni receivers and some even operated full duplex. If UHF phone doesn't interest you, how about amateur television? In 1931, you ask? Unbelievably, the answer is yes. In 1931, an article appeared in QST describing the spinning disc mechanical television system that had been around since the 1920s. It was clumsy and crude, but it worked. The Jenkins Television Corporation of Passaic, New Jersey offered a spinning disc kit within QST's pages. Within nine years, however, the mechanical system was rendered obsolete by RCA's all-electronic system. The Madrid Conference was held in 1932. Unlike the 1927 Washington Conference, amateur radio was not in danger and no frequencies were lost. 1932 also saw the expansion of the phone bands, but a special endorsement was needed to operate them. The old man was still around, with his letters in QST about rotten operators, rotten band conditions, rotten stations, etc. In fact, everything that didn't meet the old man's standards was rotten. For the past 15 years he had been writing, no one knew who he was. Finally, when Hiram Percy Maxim died in 1936, the ARRL revealed that Maxim indeed was the old man. By the way, since H.P. Maxim, W1AW, was still alive in the early 1930s, the ARRL station call was W1MK. Dealers included Uncle Dave Marks, whose first store was located at 115 North Pearl Street in Albany, New York. By 1934, the Federal Radio Commission was superseded by the FCC and a new license structure with Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses was in place. In our next installment, we will take a look at the late 1930s, particularly some events in 1938. I hope you can join me. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is pleased to announce the hiring of Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, into the role of Director of Emergency Management. Here to introduce us is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. Johnston is from Ozone, Arkansas, and comes to ARRL with 16 years of experience as the director of Johnson County, Arkansas Department of Emergency Management. 
He holds an extra class ticket and is an ARES emergency coordinator, volunteer examiner, and ARRL registered instructor. Johnston is also certified in FEMA NIMS and is a Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, OXCOM Communications Unit Leader. He holds a bachelor's degree in emergency administration and management from Arkansas Tech. ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, said Johnston's contribution will help ARRL continue to support its dedicated amateur radio emergency service volunteers, improve opportunities for training, and advance relationships throughout the emergency communications community. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. With extensive experience in interagency cooperation and planning, Johnston is well-versed in the different aspects of emergency management and leading both professional and volunteer operators. He has experience in communications planning and execution in the field and at the local and state level. As an Arkansas Master Certified Emergency Manager and past board member of Arkansas Emergency Management Association, where he served as president for two years, Johnston has experience working with government and agency representatives, as well as being boots on the ground in the field. Johnston will be based at ARRL's headquarters in Newington, Connecticut, and will be working with staff and member volunteers and coordinating with the ARRL Board's new Emergency Communications and Field Services Committee. After a successful pilot camp program in 2021, the next camp for youth on the air in the Americas has been set for June 12th through the 17th, 2022. The camp will return to the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester Township, Ohio. The application period will be open online from February 11th. Eligible participants are amateur radio operators between the ages of 15 and 25. A total of 30 campers will be accepted. Some of the 30 spots will be reserved for campers who reside outside the U.S. but still in the Americas. Priorities will be given to first-time attendees. Returning attendees will serve as camp leaders. We know that changes in the COVID-19 pandemic status between now and June will have an impact on hosting the camp, said EOTA team director Meal Rapp, WB9VPG. Should we not be able to host the camp or need to reschedule, we'll let everyone know with as much notice as possible, he said. Beginning in 2022, the camp will try to alternate scheduling each year between June and July. Rep says the camp planning working group acknowledges that avoiding all scheduling conflicts isn't possible, but hopes that alternating months will provide some diversity with school schedules, extracurricular activities, and major ham radio events. Starting in 2023, the location of the camp will rotate to various locations within the Americas. A system will be announced in which the International Amateur Radio Union, IARU, members, societies, and clubs will bid to serve as the host in the region-wide camp. For details about the camp and to sign up for updates by email, visit the Youth on the Air Camp website or contact RAP for more information. Parks on the Air Activators and Chasers had a busy year in 2021. Vance Martin, N3VEM, tallies up the numbers in this special year-end report. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your 2021 December and the year-end Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, with 2021 now in the books, Parks on the Air would like to thank the nearly 4,000 activators and 122,000 hunters who combined forces to make over 2.6 million contacts from over 10,000 parks in 45 different DXCC entities for 2021. Of particular note, we would like to congratulate Bill, K4NYM, who completed 1,260 activations for the year, and David, NG5E, who activated 421 different parks. Congratulations are also due to Gene, NT2A, who hunted 5,458 parks, and Joe, N3XLS, who made 11,467 hunter QSOs in 2021. We also want to give special acknowledgement to two hunters, N5HA, Kenneth Bailey, and W9AV, Clint Sprott, who managed to hunt at least one park every day in 2021. There are several folks, including myself, who are going to attempt the same feat in 2022. 
So stay tuned to the monthly POTA updates to see how the 2022 Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge is progressing, or follow along on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtags Bailey Sprott and Park-A-Day. From the admin team at Parks on the Air, thank you for making 2021 a blowout year for the Parks on the Air program, and we look forward to having just as much fun in 2022. And now for the monthly stats update. There was plenty of activity in the month of December to help end the year strong. The month was one of the busiest of the year, with nearly 350,000 contacts made by about 1,400 operators. These individuals put approximately 3,000 parks on the air from 23 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K7CAR with 9,808 QSOs and POTA's own WT8J who activated 69 different parks. The top hunters for the month were KB3WAV with 2,305 QSOs and K9ICP, who hunted 918 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, England was our Region 1 leader with 641 QSOs, Canada was our Region 2 leader with approximately 16,000 QSOs, and Japan was our Region 3 leader with a little over 5,000 QSOs. The top DX activator for the month was VE7NB with 2,128 QSOs from 54 different parks. Outside of North America, the top activator was JF7RJM with 1,092 QSOs from 26 different parks. We're going to expand on one of our news items, the Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. In 2021, these two operators, N5HA and W9AV, managed to hunt a park every day in 2021. There were, however, a number of individuals who came very close to accomplishing the same feat, only missing the mark by five days or less. Those operators include KW2DX, KO4SB, K9ICP, VE3LDT, WB3AVD, and AA5UZ. Just as remarkably, there was one activator who was only 18 days short of having done an activation every day of the year. That activator was Bill, K4NYM. There were several others who managed to do activations for two-thirds of the year or more, K9ZIE, KN4SWS, KB3WAV, and K5DGR. Watching these operators inspired myself and several others to attempt to hunt a park every day in 2022, and it may have inspired some to see if they can do the same for activations. During the 2022 monthly updates, part of the monthly stats feature will include an update on the progress toward these goals. To allow for wiggle room due to the timing of logs being submitted, the results will generally be shared backdated by two weeks. To get the ball rolling, however, as of today, when reviewing logs through January 7th, 2022, it appears as though we have several activators who have done a park a day so far, and approximately 160 hunters. This concludes our December 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. And now with this week's propagation forecast report, here is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle reports, two new sunspot groups emerged on January 9th and another showed up on January 12th. Average daily sunspot numbers rose six points this week to 42.4 and average daily solar flux increased from 91.4 to 101.6. The space weather woman Tamitha Skull of WX6SWW offered her perspective in her recent video report on YouTube. The solar flux because of these new active regions is increasing. We are back into triple digits. And as a matter of fact, we could actually see this rise up to 120 or even higher over this next week. And this is great news for amateur radio operators and emergency responders. The radio bands are in the green range. So expect good radio propagation on Earth's day side and expect that to last easily into next week as well. That's the latest from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. A comprehensive K7RA solar update is posted each Friday on the ARRL website. Time now for the AMSAT report as we go to press, so to speak, this week. We have a new satellite that has been launched. In fact, a bunch of brothers and sisters, eight to be exact, that were launched on January 13th on a SpaceX transporter. 
They are Tavel, T-A-V-E-L, from the Herzliya Science Center in Israel. Each has an FM transponder. Also on board were AMSAT Spain's ESAT-2 and Hades satellites. You can listen for the Tavel satellites on a downlink of 436.400 MHz and an uplink of 145.960 MHz. It'll take a few days or weeks before the satellites separate far enough. Only one transponder will be activated as long as the footprints are overlapping. Thanks to David for X1DG and the AMSAT News Service for this information. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The UK Ministry of Defence is conducting a GPS jamming exercise. It started on January the 10th, 2022, and is due to run until February the 4th, with a second period from the 21st of March until the 15th of April. The location is at the Ministry of Defence testing ground at West Frew in Dumfries and Galloway, Scotland. Ofcom said that the timing of the jamming will be limited to 08.30 to 16 hours local time, in other words, in daylight only. Jamming will be limited to the time required to demonstrate the desired effect on the target and shall not exceed two minutes continuously, with a maximum of five test points per hour and a minimum of five minutes between test points. The jammers are located in British Ordnance Survey National Grid Reference November X-Ray 119533. The frequencies affected by the operation are 1560 MHz to 1609 MHz and 1212 MHz to 1252 MHz. The worst case interference from the jamming depends on the height of the receiver. For example, at 2 meters above mean sea level, interference might be experienced at up to 7 kilometers distance. At 25 meters above mean sea level, problems could be experienced at a distance of up to 20 kilometers. An aircraft at 40,000 feet above mean sea level could be affected at up to 90 kilometers away in any direction from the jamming station. There are details of other UK GPS jamming exercises at the website www.ofcom.org.uk. The latest episode of ARRL's On the Air podcast, that's episode number 25, features a conversation with Mike Flugman, KE8AQW, about how to get started with CW. A lot of people say, you know, well, what device should I start with? And the answer is, it's really um, personal preference. Uh, some people feel that by using a straight key, you learn the rhythm of each character, and that muscle memory, along with your listening practice, will help you learn the code better. You need to be able to send and receive. You need both sides of the coin to be a good Morse code operator. And then other people prefer the paddle because it's easier to send cleaner sounding code since it will uh, make the DAWs and dashes for you. And it sometimes, uh, for some people's hands, uh, the motion is easier using paddles. So I'd suggest uh, find a ham friend who has one or both of those and then try them out. The On the Air podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Blueberry. The latest issue of the On the Air magazine contains an entire article on this subject. Foundations of Amateur Radio The other day I received an email from a fellow amateur, Elwood Whiskey Bravo Zero Oscar Echo Whiskey. We've been exchanging email for a little while, and having been in the hobby since before I learned to ride a bicycle, he's always got some interesting insight into something I've said, and an encouraging word to share. This time he introduced me to a project he built, and published a couple of years ago. It's a variable frequency standard, built from parts, and at the time costing all of about $150. More on that shortly. Compared to the microwave oven-sized HP 606A signal generator sitting on my bench in bits, with some diligent layout, this project could fit inside one of the valves that drives this massive hunk of equipment. As an aside, truth be told, I'm a little afraid of the HP. It managed to pop the RCD, a residual current device or safety switch, in my house, and in doing so took out the UPS that powers my main workstation. So, not unexpectedly, I'm reluctant to repeat the experience. Once I understand precisely what happened, I'll pick up the restoration efforts, and based on what I learned today, it might get me where I want to go faster. Elwood's Frequency Standard is a very interesting project that delivers a very precise variable frequency oscillator, or VFO, with an accuracy approaching one part per billion. 
His project uses an Arduino to control a touch-sensitive display, read a knob, and set and correct the frequency, using a GPS as an accurate external time source. It's all very compact, easy to follow, and I immediately thought that this would be an excellent project to build with a little twist. I'm thinking that it would be really great to have this device sit on your local network and make it remote controllable. The heart of this frequency standard project is a chip called an SI5351. The Silicon Labs SI5351, to use its full name, was first sold by Mauser in 2010 and has been popular since. You'll find it in all manner of places, including the Linux kernel source tree, the QRP Labs QCX and BitX, to name two, the Elecraft KX2, scores of Arduino projects, and countless frequency source products and projects used in amateur radio. The SI5351 is a configurable clock generator. Think of it as a programmable crystal that can be configured on the fly as often as you like. For configuration, it uses an I2C bus or Inter-Integrated Circuit Communications Protocol, a special serial bus intended for chip-to-chip -chip communications, invented by Philips Semiconductors in 1982. That's the same Philips from the light bulbs and audio cassettes, CD, DVD, and Blu-ray, also the Philly Shave. To complete the picture, Philips Semiconductors became NXP in September 2006. Back to our frequency standard project. I wondered if I could cut out the Arduino from the actual correction process, since I didn't need a display or a knob, and discovered that the SI5351 comes in several flavors. Elwood's design uses the A version, but there's also a C version that has the ability to take in an external clock, like say that from a GPS, and correct within the chip itself. With that information in hand, I figured that I could use a simple Wi-Fi capable system on a chip, something like say an ESP8266, to configure the clock and take care of communications with the outside world. In the process, I'd learn how to do a bunch of new things, including my first foray into generating RF, first time writing actual firmware, first time designing circuits, and no doubt many more firsts. Then I hit a snag. It seems that the SI5351 has gone from commonplace to zero in stock. Not just zero in stock in Australia or the US, no, zero in stock anywhere. There are a few A-version breakout boards, that is, the chip on a circuit board, available from one supplier. There's also a new compatible chip, an MS5351M, available from China, but that's a drop-in for the A-version, not the C-version. So where it stands is that I can almost taste the design, essentially three chips and almost trivial circuit boards, some SMA connectors, a power source, and an external GPS antenna something that would represent the very first circuit I actually designed, which is a long way from reading the circuit diagram for my Commodore VIC-20 back in the days before I owned a soldering iron. It did bring me face to face with an odd realization. There are components that we use in day-to-day -day use, ones that are common, used across many different industries that come from a single source. I should also mention that this particular manufacturer just got sold to another company, which doesn't help matters. Nobody seems to know how long this shortage might last, with forecasts varying wildly, but I'm beginning to wonder how many of these kinds of components exist, and how we might reduce our dependence on single supplier hardware. I'm also starting to look at using an FPGA to do all of this in software, but that's going to take some time. Of course, we could start using valves again, my 1960s era HP signal generator is starting to look much less intimidating. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Georgian Bay Amateur Radio Club, VE3OSR in Canada, is offering a way for hams to reconnect with one another through clubs, especially if they have lost touch during the pandemic. Clubs throughout Canada, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, are now shown on a colorful map display, which is free online for all hams reference. The Georgian Bay amateurs are encouraging other clubs in Canada to add themselves to the map, which can be done by using the button labeled Contact on the bottom of the webpage containing the map. Visit gbarc.ca stroke clubs.php. Congratulations to Silas Davis, W3SED, Olivia Lee, KD2UYX, and Isaac Schmidt, K6IAS. 
The three youngsters wrote the winning essays in the Intrepid DX Group's second annual Young Dream Rig Contest. Hams from around the United States who are 19 years old or younger were eligible. Silas, the first place winner, is nine. This year's contest took place with the help of funding from Amateur Radio Digital Communications. The youngsters were asked to address the question of how amateur radio can evolve to remain relevant in the internet age. You can find the winning essays on the ARDC webpage. In announcing the winners previously, Paul Ewing, N6PSE, president of the Intrepid DX Group, said the essays were brimming with enthusiasm to keep our hobby alive well into the future. Mike Subak, VK3AVV, forward slash VK3JV, was known locally as an active and valued member of the Eastern and Mountain District Radio Club, VK3ER, where he was recently awarded a life membership. But in a larger world of amateur radio, he was appreciated even more for his support of contesters and those involved in special events everywhere. Mike became a silent key on the 5th of January, as reported by one of his close friends, Peter Forbes, VK3QL. Mike was the author of the widely used VKCL contest logging software, a free program that became a mainstay for a number of events in Australia, including the VHF UHF field days of the Wireless Institute of Australia. The program had been in use for more than 20 years. Roger Harrison, VK2ZRH, Australia's amateur radio magazine editor-in-chief, recalled how he and Mike worked side-by-side -side since 2014 as managers of those field days. The software's ease of use and versatility made it particularly appreciated by contest managers as well as participants. The Wireless Institute of Australia noted on its Facebook page, Mike leaves behind a tremendous legacy of hard and dedicated work and his love for amateur radio. The Eastern and Mountain District Club announced on its webpage that all stations in the VHF UHF contest on January 15th would observe a one minute silence in Mike's memory. The contest will therefore start at 0101 UTC. Joseph M. Gribb Jr., KI3B, has been appointed to fill the role of Delaware Section Manager on an interim basis. A DuPont retiree, Gribb lives in Bear, Delaware, and is active in the local repeater association. Outside of ham radio, he enjoys saltwater fishing, the beach, and computers. Gribb is an avid CW operator, but enjoys other modes as well, including SSB, DMR, and D-Star. Gribb's appointment was effective on December 31, 2021, when the term of former section manager Mark Stillman, KA3, JUJ, ended. Gribb will serve in the role at least until July 1, 2022. ARRL is soliciting candidates for Delaware section manager, and nominating petitions are due by March 4, 2022. All electrical and electronic devices in South Africa that do not have radio frequency modules must now have valid electromagnetic compatibility certificates recognized by the South African Bureau of Standards. The South African Radio League News Service reports that the new rules should go a long way to take electronics off the market that cause radio interference. Electronics like switch mode power supplies, light emitting diodes and electronic equipment where noise suppression circuitry has been omitted to save cost. The new rule comes after the Bureau of Standards and the regulator, Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, better known as ICASA, were met with criticism after they tried to implement a new compliance regime in 2017. Among the concerns were that only compliance certificates from test laboratories integrated into the Bureau's authorised laboratory programme would be recognised. ICASA and the South African Bureau of Standards have now changed their approach, recognising internationally accredited labs. Ironically, the South African Radio League has on several occasions tried to discuss this issue with ICASA and is delighted that this has now been resolved. This new rule may have a positive impact on type approval. The SARL has requested an urgent meeting of their liaison committee with ICASA to pursue the matter. You can read more in the SARL Weekly News at www.sarl.org.za. NASA has recognized amateur radio on the International Space Station as a science education and research program. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more. 
Two images of ARIS activity are among those singled out by the space agency as some of the best space station science pictures of 2021. ARRL representative to ARIS International, Rosalie White, K1STO, said recognition is significant because it shows that NASA considers the ARIS program to be within the realm of science education and research. This is a really big deal for ARIS, she said, and we are really proud of the team. White said the most important aspect of the recognition is that it shows NASA believes in ARIS's efforts in the realm of science education and research. They call our radio contacts ISS experiments, just as we call each radio contact an ARIS experiment, she said. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The introduction to the new video was shared by NASA on Twitter. It has been a busy year of research aboard the International Space Station. NASA's SpaceX Crew-1, Crew-2, and Crew-3 missions supported hundreds of science experiments aboard the orbiting laboratory. ARIS team member Armand Budzianowski, SP3QFE, wrote, It is phenomenal that we were honored as creating science. It is a proud moment that ARIS and Amateur Radio were honored for the field of science and research by NASA. NASA also shared the photos on its website. The EASAT-2 and Hades satellites launched on January 13th on a SpaceX TR-3 flight. AMSAT has reported citing information provided by AMSAT EA President and Mission Manager Felix Payez. Both will carry amateur radio payloads offering FM voice and data tree transmission in FSK or AFSK up to 2,400 bits per second. And Hades is equipped for slow scan TV and FM voice beacons with call signs AM, AM5 SAT for ESAT 2 and AM6 SAT for the Hades satellite. ESAT-2 was designed and built by AMSAT-EA and students from the University in Eastern Europe in, in degrees in aerospace engineering, in aircraft, and in telecommunications systems engineering. It carries an experimental load of basalt material from Lanzarote that is similar to lunar basalts. It's believed that this material, which was provided by the CSIC Research Group on Meteorites and Planetary Geosciences at the Institute of Geosciences, could be used as lunar construction material. During the various investigations, UNESCO World Geopark of Lanzarote and the Chinijo Archipelago have served as an analog of the Moon and Mars, as well as for training European Space Agency astronauts. The purpose of the basalt experiment is to determine its evolution in space based on periodic measurements of some of its properties. Although the experiment is limited and constitutes the first phase of this type of study, it represents an important milestone as it's the first of its kind to be introduced on such a small satellite. The Hades payload consists of a miniature camera, the output of which will be transmitted as an audio signal on the SST mode. The transmissions will be compatible with Robot 36, Robot 72, MP73, and MP115. The camera module design is based on one used successfully in the PSAT-2 satellite, which was built by cadets at the U.S. Naval Academy and by students at Brno University of Technology and has been in use since 2019. The system will be controlled completely from the ground. The SSTV firmware will permit sending live images as well as images saved in flash memory or encoded in onboard read-only memory. It also provides PSK telemetry and imaging advanced scheduling with current status event counters, temperature, voltage, light conditions, etc., and a brief summary, Paez said. The SAT-2 frequencies are 145.875 MHz uplink, FM voice, no subtone, and FSK 50 beats per second, AFSK AX.25, APRS 1200-2400 BPS. 436.666 MHz downlink, FM voice, CW, FSK 50 BPS, FM voice beacon with call sign, AM5 SAT. The Hades frequencies are 145.925 MHz uplink, FM voice, no subtone, FSK 50 BPS, AFSK, AX.25, APRS 1200-2400 BPS. 
436.888 megahertz downlink, FM voice, CW, FSK 50 BPS, SSTV robot 36, FM voice beacon with call sign, AM6 SAT. The Tevil mission, which consists of eight satellites carrying amateur radio FM transponders, also launched on January 13th at 1525 UTC on SpaceX Falcon 9 Transporter 3 mission. The Tevil satellites were developed by the Herzliya Science Center in Israel. All eight satellites will use these same frequencies as long as their footprints overlap, and only one FM transponder will be activated at a time. Beacon transmissions will be on the 436.400 MHz using 9,600 BPS, BPSK. The uplink frequency of the SM FM transponders is 145.970 MHz, and the downlink frequency is 436.400 MHz. The satellites were built by eight schools in different parts of Israel. For more information on all the satellites, go to the website from AMSAT. As membership of the Slow Morse Club surpasses 8,000, this is a little reminder to those who might be thinking of joining the apparent renaissance of CW operating. The club welcomes all who are interested in operating Slow Morse on air, regardless of ability in the mode. For the more experienced, there is the chance to coach, and for the newbies, the chance to learn, and more importantly, use Morse on air, perhaps for the first time. Knowing that your contact is a friendly face who's not going to chastise you if your QSO doesn't quite abide by the normal conventions of Morse, for example if you make a mistake, helps to overcome some of the anxiety of using this most skillful of radio modes. The club has a Facebook page for general chit-chat and it uses the Signal instant messaging app for arranging skeds and advising others of slow CW contacts in real time. If you think you might be interested, why not look up the Slow Morse Club? You'll be very welcome. The Orlando Hamcation has announced that Dick Philistra, PA0DFN, is the 2022 recipient of the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. We get more details on the award now from Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. The award recognizes an outstanding contribution to education and advancing youth in amateur radio. It was first awarded in 2018 to its namesake, Carol Perry, WB2MGP, to recognize her work in teaching students about ham radio. Orlando Hamcation and ARRL are sponsoring the 2022 ARRL National Convention, February 10th through the 13th. Filstra is the first international winner of the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. A retired school principal, he has worked for years to reach out to youth with the latest technology in ham radio. At Ham Radio Events, he helps groups of youngsters in building electronic projects, guiding groups of other hams to assist them to finish the projects correctly. He also has organized international school projects, including the Communication Helps International Progress, or CHIP, program with participating schools throughout Europe. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Perry is a past Dayton Hamvention Amateur of the Year and recipient of the AWRL Instructor of the Year Award. She has moderated the Hamvention Youth Forum for more than three decades. Felistra is the Netherlands International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, Veron's Region 1 Amateur Radio Direction Finding Committee Working Group member. It focuses on the European Youth ARDF championships on transmitter hunting activities and competitions. Felissa also is very active in ARDF. Two spacecraft comprised of wood or using wooden framing are hoping to launch this year and next. One will carry an amateur radio payload. WISA Woodsat, a Finnish spacecraft that was planned to include an amateur radio payload, was forced to postpone its announced launch target from 2021 to 2022 after the International Amateur Radio Union Amateur Satellite Frequency Coordination System turned away its request to use the amateur radio frequencies. I regret to inform you that the IARU is not in a position to support the WISA Woodsat coordination request. The coordinator said the main reason is the primary mission doesn't seem to be an amateur mission. As announced last year, WISA Woodsat was designed to accommodate multiple missions from material science, space education, and awareness to promoting and facilitating amateur radio with via satellites and no transponder was heard on board. 
But the satellite sponsors said they had the support of Finland's IARU member society, uh, SRAL, to use amateur radio frequencies. They're now reworking the spacecraft to use commercial radio frequencies. To our great disappointment, we cannot serve the radio amateur community with the low RA repeater mission as we'd hoped and planned. We'll continue to share pictures and data online, but the technical aspect has been diminished due to this decision, said WISA Woodsat's chief engineer, Samuli Nyman of the Ar Arctic Astronautics Company. Meanwhile, Lignosat, a 1U-sized CubeSat with an outside structure mainly composed of wood, has applied for IARU frequency coordination and hopes to launch the ISS in 2023. Built by students at Japan's Kyoto University, Lignosat includes a unique radio amateur payload, but not a transponder. The Lignosat application for IARU satellite coordination in December said the CubeSat would carry amateur radio equipment that will extract call signs of amateur stations from uplinked FM packet signals and respond to them via the CW downlink, the sender's call signs to convey thank you messages. The plan opposed UHF downlinks for CW and FM. The satellite's development team, comprised of Kyoto University and Sumitomo Forestry Company, said it's aiming to harness the environmental friendliness and the economy of wood in spacecraft development. They say a satellite with a wood exterior would burn up on re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at the end of the mission, lessening its burden on the environment. The wooden framework would also permit satellite antennas to be inside the spacecraft, a plan underway to use experimental apparatus on the International Space Station to hold wooden sheets of varying hardness taken from three tree species that was attached. These would remain exposed to the space elements for about nine months to determine their deterioration. The team was headed by Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Tako Doi, now a Kyoto University professor. Doi was the first JAXA astronaut to take part in spacewalks from the shuttle Columbia in 1997. He said the concept, if successful, would lead to the way of allowing even children who are interested in space to make a satellite. Lignosat is scheduled to be deployed from the space station on July of 2023. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Over the years I've been a tower climber, I've had to work at night. When I tell people I climb at night, I usually get more comments from that than I do from climbing in general. Most of the towers I've been on are close to populated areas, and since most populated areas are full of street lights, I've noticed that most of these towers are easily seen at night, and I often do not use my headlamp while climbing up the tower. Now this may only apply to towers less than 200 feet tall, or job sites on a tower lower than 200 feet. Since the light from street lights shines upwards, even a small of amount of light is usually makes the tower stand out boldly against a black sky. Now it may not appear when you first arrive at the tower that it's easy to see, but after your eyes adjust to the dark, it will become a lot easier. When climbing downwards, the lighting is different, and here is where I use my headlamp. I wear a headband type flashlight I purchased at our local Walmart for about $8. I also bring along extra AA batteries. If you were going to do a job that would last more than 20 minutes or so, or higher than ambient light would allow you to climb upwards without extra light, I would recommend a style of light with an external gel cell type battery. Also, a surprising amount of light can come from the moon. And when you get above the street lights, you may be surprised how well you can see with no added light. Some climbers do not like to work on wet towers, which is understandable. Lots of times at night, dew forms on towers, which can make them dripping wet. And I've noticed over the years that this wetness usually only goes to about 20 or 30 feet or so above the ground and then stops. Some of the best scenery I've seen is late at night on a tower. At night, fog can make the visibility poor on the ground, but often stops before you get to the spot on the tower you need to get to. Climbing above the fog on a night with a full moon can provide some spectacular views as the fog looks thick enough like you could step off the tower and walk on top of it. Too bad this would be nearly impossible to photograph. Finally, I've noticed that Mother Nature tends to calm down at night, say after midnight. If there's a job you've been needing to get done, but wind or storms have kept you off the tower, check out the weather after midnight, then give it a try. Don't forget that ground crew, and never climb alone, especially at night. Also, don't forget extra batteries for your flashlight. 
And don't use the kind of flashlight you hold in your hand. Spotlights on the ground will only blind you on the tower, so don't let people shine lights up at you. When I do a night job, I often call the local police to let them know I'll be there so I don't get a light shine in my eyes. Plus, if they're bored and the donut shops are closed, they may even offer to be a ground crew for you. Now remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced the schools and organizations hoping to host ham radio contacts with an International Space Station crew member. Contacts would take place between July 1st and December 31st. Eight of the proposals submitted during the recent proposal window have been accepted to move forward in the selection processes. The primary goal of the ARIS program is to engage young people in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematical activities and to raise their awareness of space communications, radio communications, space exploration, and related areas of study and career possibilities. The ARIS program anticipates that NASA will be able to offer scheduling opportunities for all eight hosting schools and organizations during the second half of the year. Final selection is pending on the receipt by ARIS of an acceptable equipment plan that demonstrates their ability to execute the ham radio contact. Once their equipment plan is approved by ARIS technical mentors, the final selected schools, organizations will be scheduled as their availability and flexibility match up with the scheduling opportunities offered by NASA. The schools and host organizations are the Bueller Challenger and Science Center in Paramus, New Jersey, the Eaton Public Library in Eaton, Colorado, the Davis Aerospace Technical High School in Detroit, Michigan, the St. Stephen's Episcopal School in Houston, Texas, the Harris Middle School in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, the Copernic Observatory and Science Center in Vestal, New York, the Monroe Corral Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee, and the Canterbury School, Fort Myers, Florida. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. U.S. sponsors are AMSAT, ARRL, the ISS National Laboratory Space Station Explorers, and NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program. Before and during radio contacts, the ISS crew members, students, educators, parents, and communities take part in hands-on learning activities tied to space, space technologies, and amateur radio. You can visit the ARIS website for more information at ARIS.org. That's A-R-I-S-S dot org. Following recent flooding in Malaysia, the Malay Mail looks at what can be done to improve disaster management, and amateur radio gets a mention. The newspaper spoke to two disaster management experts who listed various things Malaysia needs to improve on, including harnessing real-time data, tapping into the wisdom of local residents and locally based agencies in the disaster-prone or disaster-hit area itself, and investing to reduce the impact from the floods themselves. In multi-tier emergency communications, there cannot be a break in relaying the disaster risks. In Malaysia, the flood situation is communicated between federal and state governments and local districts, or between government agencies. They need to inform local community organisations, who can then alert the local communities in their area. For example, if you send a message at 2am, it must be properly received at the local level as soon as possible, regardless of the time of day. A list of actions must be prepared in advance for such a scenario, together with the establishing of platforms or tools to communicate and pass along orders. Disaster experts noted that there is a need to provide backup for communications during disasters between the local communities, district offices and the State Disaster Operations Command Centre. This is in situations where social media, such as WhatsApp, cannot be relied upon when the electricity supply is cut off and mobile phone batteries are running flat. One of the experts visited Hulu Langat in Selangor during the floods, and he noted, for example, that the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society had briefly stepped in to help re-establish communications in the area when there was no electricity and the usual mobile networks were down. You can read more at www.malaymail.com And the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society website is at marts.org.my Starlink's satellite internet performance has fallen victim to neighborhood felines attracted to the warmth its dish gives off on cold days. 
Elon Musk's satellite internet company, Starlink, has ambitious plans to bring internet access to people anywhere in the world. But it turns out the venture is providing another service, warming up cats. A customer tweeted a photo of five cats huddled on his Starlink dish, which links homes to more than a thousand satellites, and noted that the presence of the furtive felines had slowed his internet performance. Starlink works great until the cats find out that the dish gives off a little heat on cold days, Aaron Taylor said. After the photo was widely shared online, Taylor clarified that the cats had taken to the dish by choice rather than necessity. They have a heated cat house with water and food, but they will usually decide to sit on the Starlink dish. When the sun goes down, they head back to their house, he said. The attraction may be due to a self-heating feature on the dish, which is designed to melt snow. In 2020, Starlink engineers touted efforts to upgrade our snow melting ability. Taylor said the cat's attraction to his Starlink dish interrupted movie streaming and affected internet speed. It doesn't shut it down completely, but definitely slows everything down, he said. He also said he plans to move the dish from the ground to a higher location. Starlink, a division of Musk's SpaceX company, has launched more than 1,600 satellites in low Earth orbit. The constellation of satellites is still under construction with more launches planned. The company, which has permission from U.S. authorities to launch up to 12,000 satellites, says the service is ideally suited for areas where connectivity has been unreliable or completely unavailable. The apparent attraction of Starlink dishes to cats has not been the only hiccup, however. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5.